monsters, ancient big birds, beasts. Kids and kids at heart are fascinated with these animals. They haven't existed on Earth in 67 million years, but their bones have been found on every single continent. Because back then there was only one continent, Pangaea. And migratory animals such as these could walk anywhere. But what do we actually know about these dinosaurs? Such as the iconic T-Rex. What can we glean from bones stuck in rock for millions of years? Will we ever get to see living dinosaurs on Earth again? This is Fact and Science Fiction. I'm your host, Carly, and this episode I'm talking about dinosaurs. Setting out onto this episode, most of what I learned from dinosaurs, I learned from Jurassic Park. And nerds correcting Jurassic Park. Say it with me now, it should have been called Cretaceous Park. Because the Jurassic era didn't have those kinds of dinosaurs. Anyway, I've never been one to memorize dinosaur species, and I just have a thin grasp on how the animal kingdom is sorted by genus and species anyway. But I love Jurassic Park. It's one of the best films ever made, and for some reason parents didn't mind showing young children that movie, because it's been iconic since day one, no matter the age group. But the idea of Jurassic Park, the idea that present-day people could interact with dinosaurs, has been present in speculative or science fiction for almost 200 years, since the first fossils were found. Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth, published in 1864, was about subterranean worlds where prehistoric animals still existed. Or Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, published as a serial in 1912, about a South American expedition led by an explorer named Challenger to an area where dinosaurs still roamed. Or just a few years later, Edgar Rice Burroughs' The Land That Time Forgot, published in 1918 about World War I soldiers finding a prehistoric island. I haven't read The Land That Time Forgot, but there's a really funny Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode about its movie adaptation. By the way, it's on Netflix. So it's clear that dinosaur fossils have captured the imagination of science fiction writers for decades. In the 1800s and early 1900s, there were still uncharted areas of the world that somehow, possibly in the wildest dreams, could have protected ancient animals from extinction. And there's some truth to that, where researchers have traveled to South America like the rainforest in Brazil and found species of animal that are still so like their ancient ancestors or areas in Australia or New Zealand where there's still wilderness and very few carnivorous predators, so animals like echidna and platypus baffle us because they lay eggs and have evidence of electroreception like eels do, except they're land animals. Surely these animals must be from some forgotten time. And then there are still huge reptiles like crocodiles that haven't evolved much since their ancient ancestors, except for, you know, being smaller. For example, Dinosuchus was bigger than any carnivorous dinosaur. It was a 40-feet-long crocodile, a predator of the Tyrannosaurus. Personally, I'll be honest, I have a deep-seated fear of aquatic predators. Blame it on seeing Jaws too young, but immediate fear response as soon as I see just an artistic rendition of one. This especially applies to aquatic dinosaurs that are bigger and scarier than sharks. I recently learned the name of that aquatic dinosaur in Jurassic World. They're like monitor lizards, except huge and in water, um, Mosasaurus. And then there's the plesiosaur, like those long neck Nessie-like creatures. I remember in 7th or 8th grade, I read a really scary book about a plesiosaur, and I still haven't forgotten the cover of that book. Let's tackle some misconceptions about dinosaurs, as perpetuated by science fiction. One of the things sci-fi and sci-fi horror gets wrong with these large reptilian bird-like predators is that they eat everybody. Like in Jurassic Park movies, the T-Rex and the Velociraptors hunt a person every five minutes. 
But like sharks and other reptiles, they're cold-blooded. They can eat once and be full for days or even weeks. The fact that these dinosaurs would need to eat a human every few minutes is pretty crazy. The dinosaurs would have probably eaten themselves to extinction if that were the case. Number two, there's a misconception that fossils found by paleontologists are all just bones, that there's no biological materials. You imagine these nerds using soft brushes to reveal clean bones in the earth. But they found that there's often a lot of biological material in well-preserved fossils, like they're almost mummies sometimes with skin attached. So nowadays, paleontologists can learn a lot about what dinosaurs look like. It's summertime, and summer is the time to do fun stuff, like road trips, sitting by the pool or the lake, or maybe doing some DIY projects for your home. And you know what goes great with all those things? Audiobooks. For you, the listeners of Fact and Science Fiction, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I recommend Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park to go along with all the stuff you learned today. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash factandsci-fi. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash f-a-c-t-a-n-d-s-c-i-f-i. Swipe over to the show notes to get that handy link and start your trial today. For a long time, paleontology was mostly concerned with finding bones and studying the anatomy, classifying these animals by their relation to each other, but it's only been recently that these researchers have been studying biology and behavior. And by recently, I mean just in the last 25 years, which in the span of paleontology is pretty recent. So David Fostovsky at the University of Rhode Island wrote a review of the current literature in the area of dinosaur behavior and what the field of paleontology has kind of agreed on at that point. That was in 2008, though, so keep that in mind as I go through this information. So it may be a little bit out of date, but it was still a helpful article. So lots of people are interested in carnivorous dinosaurs feeding behavior, right? Like the thrilling parts of Jurassic Park was the T-Rex snapping up that goat in within seconds. Carnivorous dinosaurs are referred to as theropods in the field, and scientists have studied impressions of bite marks on prey to hypothesize what kind of hunters tyrannosauruses were like. Now, tyrannosaurs weren't T-Rexes, but a distant cousin of T-Rex. If you kind of remember, you know, high school biology and learning about the animal classifications, um, Tyrannosaurus is the genus, Rex is the species. So uh, when I say Tyrannosaurus, I mean just the genus uh, encapsulating all the species of that group. Anyway, back to their feeding behavior, it's actually more complicated than I thought. There's some evidence to suggest that Tyrannosaurus were more scavengers than active predators. But if they were active predators, were Tyrannosaurus able to kill prey just in one bite? Or would they slowly kill their prey by chasing them, take a bite out of them when they could, and then just wait for their prey to die out of loss of blood, or maybe even a venomous saliva like Komodo dragons? If Tyrannosaurus were more of the chasing, snapping kind, then there is evidence of them being pack hunters. Tyrannosaurus rex, however, have much more powerful jaws than their distant cousins, and perhaps were able to have large crushing bites that would kill their prey in one go. So T-Rexes could be more solitary hunters like they are in the movies, not needing the help of a social group to feed. In Jurassic Park, their vision was evolved to only moving prey, so the characters could avoid detection by being very still. But the actual research suggests that T-Rexes had very powerful senses of smell, suggesting that they could be scavengers too, like carry-on birds. Or if they were active predators, keeping very still wouldn't have helped much. And there is some evidence that they had perfectly good eyesight anyway, not based on movement, but with sharp eyes like birds of prey. Another behavior that researchers are fascinated by is nesting behavior. So we all know that dinosaurs lay eggs, except for mosasaurs that I mentioned earlier. They're so well adapted to living in water that they do live births. So scientists try to determine what nesting behavior dinosaurs had. Were they like sea turtles, where they would lay eggs and then leave their young to fend for themselves once they hatched? Were they more like birds in the trees outside our house that we see each spring, where they take care of their young until the young can fend for themselves? Some species, like the duck-billed Myasaura, have been found with their young in nests, suggesting parental rearing, like the latter example. One herbivore species, called Oryctodromius, 
was found with two juveniles in a den of sorts underground, like a maintained chamber. And the anatomy of that species supported digging behavior, like strong shoulders and a strengthened snout, compared to their genetic relatives. This suggests that some dinosaurs could protect their young or escape predators or weather events underground, which is a pretty new discovery. So, did they have feathers? Because dinosaurs are the ancient ancestors of birds, it's likely that dinosaurs had feathers or the beginnings of feathers called protofeathers, though we don't know what texture or color they were. Perhaps they were all born with feathers to keep them warm, you know, because they're cold-blooded, and then they lost their feathers as they reached adulthood. At least in the T-Rex case, that may be possible. Mary Schweitzer, a molecular paleontologist who specializes in the remnants of ancient tissue, speculates that the skin of a mature T-Rex without the feathers would probably be like chicken legs, so a little scaly, probably pretty resistant to water and degradation, at least while they're alive. Mary Schweitzer was featured in a documentary currently streaming on Netflix called Dinosaurs, The Hunt for Life, which was all about finding biological material in dinosaur fossils, like I mentioned earlier. Many fossils have found have been so degraded by the environment that there's no biological clues like tissues or cells, but some well-preserved fossils have been instrumental in finding clues to dinosaur evolution, behavior, and gender identification. So one of the best Twitter accounts online today is Sue, the cheeky T-Rex exhibit at the Field Museum in Chicago. Sue goes by pronouns they and them because the sex of this fossil cannot be determined or confirmed. It's actually pretty difficult to determine male or female dinosaurs unless they have laid eggs. Reproducing female dinosaurs have a flexible bone in their body to help them lay eggs. Chickens and other birds have this bone, and it was just recently discovered in dinosaur fossils. But it's only developed when female dinosaurs reach maturity to begin mating. So fossils can be found without this bone, but that doesn't mean they're all male. That just means they weren't reproducing at the time of their death. Discovering the biological tissues and cells found in well-preserved fossils has ignited again the speculation that we could clone or somehow revive these extinct animals. A new story went viral recently about some scientists saying we could do that within five years. Our long history of science fiction telling us that's a bad idea aside, it would be extremely difficult to do so. Like Mary Schweitzer said in The Hunt for Life, even if we were able to isolate DNA from dinosaurs when they're, from their bones or mosquitoes preserved in amber, etc., it would be fragile and degraded. We just have chunks of DNA, and in order to clone or edit this DNA, we would need to know the precise sequence. In Jurassic Park, they used frog DNA to fill in these gaps. But you'd need the exact formula to do so. You can't just gloop, inject frog DNA, and hope it all works out. And then there's the ethics involved in doing so. Why bring back dinosaurs when there are endangered species that are close to extinction now? They need rehabilitation and perhaps genetic therapies to survive. Of course, there are scientists working on that now, too. It's not like all of scientists, you know, have this one project they're working on. But I think for real life and not science fiction, we should focus on how we can help animals today rather than bring back animals from millions of years ago. Not to say that it's not important to study dinosaurs. It's always good to learn more about dinosaurs. We can learn more about, you know, mass extinctions, and we can learn more about evolution, and just because it's interesting. Study away, nerds. Research from this episode came from Five Things We Don't Know About Tyrannosaurus Rex on Smithsonian Magazine, David Fostovsky's Dinosaur Behavior in Access Science, and Dinosaurs the Hunt for Life, or BBC, now streaming on Netflix. Help this podcast grow by leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podchaser.com. Tell your friends on Twitter and Facebook and tag my handle, Fact and Sci-Fi. If you leave a review or contact me in social media, I will give you a shout out on my next episode. Check out the script for this episode and other content on the site, FactAndScienceFiction.com. And lastly, thanks for listening. 